Hey, yo, what's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to HQ. It's your boy Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. It's actually Tuesday right now, and my in the muck Monday video it was supposed to come out yesterday, but your man's was at a bachelor party this weekend. And if you join me on the live stream on Sunday, which you should always join me for the live streams on Sunday, hit that notification button right below the video to make sure you're notified when I go live. I was in no shape, form to get anything productive done. I literally had one of you guys telling me, shout out, um, I'm sorry, whoever it was was telling me. I had someone telling me every 10 minutes that I had to breathe slowly. I was about to, have, I was about to pass out and have a heart attack. Therefore, I'm gonna get the video up today, my In The Muck Tuesday video. We're doing JJ versus Alex Collins. Two running backs who should, if all things break right, be the featured back on their team, but there's definitely some red flags for both guys. A lot of upside, so I wanted to dive in and discuss who of these two running backs, if any, or both, you should take in your 2018 fantasy football draft. Before we start, as I usually always do, I want you to take a second, go down below, comment which of the two backs you would rather take prior to my analysis. I like to get a general consensus of my audience because when I talked about it during the live stream, I had a lot of people like definitely Ajayi, definitely Collins. It was a mixed bag. Comment down below real quick who you would rather have prior to the analysis, Jay Ajayi or Alex Collins, straight up, regardless of ADP or wherever you have to draft them. Let's crack. All right, so as we always do, we're gonna take a look at where they're being drafted right now. According to MFL 10, which is a cash league accurate ADPs, we have Alex Collins off the board, 48, JJ 49, RB 22, RB 23, respectively. These are gonna be a little bit different from site to site depending on where you're drafting or where you're getting your data from. But let's get into the, the individuals at stake here. We're gonna start with Alex Collins because he is going one pick ahead of JJ. 48th overall, running back 22. And in, in my opinion, in my opinion, if these, if these guys in a vacuum on the same team, same depth chart, Alex Collins wins this seven out of 10 times in terms of just straight up talent and what he offers as a running back. But for fantasy football pur purposes, he is kind of an enigma this year because he played so, 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 so well and you would expect him to be the guy in Baltimore, but there are still absolutely red flags. There are diff different things coming into the equation um, than there were at the end of the stretch run last year where we saw Collins kind of dominate touches and, and be the guy in Baltimore. So we got to dive a little bit deeper into that. Now, Collins was a former fifth round draft pick um, in 2016. So he's young still. Uh, he was drafted by Seattle. Seattle cut him. Baltimore picked him up and put him on the practice squad, then uh, promoted him right after week one. Did not take long for this guy to emerge and show that he was by far the most talented guy in this Baltimore backfield. Like I said, just 23 years old, so still very, 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 very young. Um, there are some guys that can't, I think some of the running backs in this year's draft might be older than him, to be honest with you, or at least some of the wide receivers are. He would, despite being promoted after week one, right? Not having an actual off season with the team, not having like anything working towards him, finished with 973 rushing yards, six touchdowns on 212 carries, additional 187 yards through the air on 23 rece receptions. Sorry, I'm gonna be a little bit scattered today. My brain is still piecing my memories back together from Saturday. Um, okay, so he scored six rushing touchdowns on just three goal line carries, and that was in 15 games. So we're talking about over 1,160 total yards in 15 games for a guy who started the year on a practice squad. I would call that a breakout if I've ever heard of one. And by halfway through the season, Collins had dominated that Baltimore backfield. He was seeing over 19 touches a game from week eight till the end of the season. Now, over 19 touches a game is no, is no, is, is no fluke, right? When you when you put over 19 touches times 16, 19.2 times 16, 307 touches for the season. If you're getting a 300 touch back, you're getting that's RB1 type volume. And Collins wasn't just a volume guy either. I'm going to break down some of the numbers from an efficiency standpoint here. Collins ranked very highly in a large number of categories. Most notably, he graded out as Pro Football Focus's number one running back in 2017, like their player grades. He was the number one back, followed closely by Kareem Hunt, Todd Gurley, then Dalvin Cook in his limited sample. 4.6 yards per carry on his 212 carries, 4.6 yards per carry, ranked fifth among NFL running backs, 
with more than 120 carries, which was 36 running backs. So fifth out of 36 in yards per carry. Obviously, that's not a great efficiency number to use because there's so many variables that could affect that. Offensive line play is the defense stacking boxes and shit like that. Um, 3.0 yards after contact was eighth in the NFL. His tackles avoided per attempt per pro football focus ranked 12th in the NFL. His success rate per football outsiders was eighth among 47 qualified running backs. When we look at player, player profiler, he had the second most breakaway runs, so 15 plus yards, second highest percentage of runs go for breakaways, fifth highest broken tackles per touch, eighth in yards created, fourth in yards per carry versus a stacked box. Hear that last one. Fourth in yards per carry versus a stacked box, 5.3 yards per carry versus a stacked box. So I'm just trying to give you all different sources, player profiler, pro football focus, football outsiders, to show you that while a lot of efficiency metrics are pretty subjective to whoever is grading these players, he was objectively very, very, very good as a running back last year from all of these sites. Collins was a beast. If you watched him play, he reminded me a lot of Marshawn Lynch because he can give you the pounding, right? He's a bigger back who's certainly capable of going within the tackles, but he has a lot of wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. He actually reminds me, I think we're going to see, I think Darius Geis, this just popped into my head. I think Darius Geis and Alex Collins are very similar in uh, skill set. I think Darius Geis has a little more explosion. Like, you'll see Darius Geis break off more 30, 40-yard runs, right? He has that kind of home run speed as well. But I think they move a lot, a lot of the same way. They're violent, they hit the holes hard, and they have good evasion, good wiggle, good um, agility, and things like that. So that kind of just came to my head. But that for people that didn't watch Collins run last year, he's kind of like a Marshawn Lynch who was also compared to a Darius Geis. So same kind of player. And when you really start diving in, man, Collins was – was really, 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 really good given the opportunity that he had. And per Evan Silva's uh, Baltimore Ravens team preview, he does a team preview every for every all th 32 NFL teams, which I highly recommend you guys check out. Collins did all of this while left guard Alex Lewis and all pro right guard Marshall Yonda uh, were lost for 30 combined games due to injury in 2017. That's obviously a big Plus, if they're back healthy in 2018. Now, Collins was widely written off as a zero in the passing game, which is a lot of the knock that people are giving him now. Um, but that wasn't really the case, man. As I mentioned before, he added 187 yards on 23 catches with a respectable 8.1 yards per reception, which is not bad for a uh, for a running back, right? So Collins was amazing last year. That's all I've been saying is how good he was. Yak, 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 yak. So what's the problem here? Why is he not going higher? That's, you know, that's where in the muck comes in. We got to get in the grit. We got to get in the muck and talk about what's going on in this backfield. Okay, so the problems I see for Alex Collins in 2018, it's kind of twofold. For one, although they did not address the position in the NFL draft or through free agency, they still have Javorius, Buck Allen, as I like to call him, Suck Allen, in the backfield with Alex Collins, as well as this guy called Kenneth Dixon. Now, I want to talk about Suck Allen first. They used him way more than any team should ever use Buck Allen. One of the big reasons was Allen was very good in pass blocking. He graded out very high in pass blocking. Um, and the Ravens thought he was a great third down back. They thought he was a great receiving back for whatever reason. I want to list off some of these statistics right here. Allen saw 60 targets last year. 60 targets last year, which ranked pretty highly among running backs. I don't have the exact number, but actually I'll pull it up for you right now. Where did Javorius... Javorius. How do you get Buck from Javorius? Whoever knows the origin of that story, can you leave a comment down below? Wade, I know you probably, you you know. There's no doubt in my mind you know, Wade. Leave a comment down below. Why, why if, his, if his name is Javorius, why do they call him Buck? Okay, so among running backs last year, his 60 targets ranked 15th. Okay. But he wasn't even used. All the other guys ahead of him are not full-time. They're either full-time backs or specialty passing Pass catching back. So, anyway, 60 targets last year. There's not a single reason on fucking planet Earth that he should have seen 60 targets last year when you break the numbers down. 5.4 yards per reception. 5.4 yards per reception. Ranked 74th among 78 running backs. He also ranked 74th among 78 running backs in yards after the catch. Just awful. But no, let's also get him involved in the red zone, where a guy who has no wiggle, or a guy who does nothing but put his head down, catch the ball, and fall, let's get him heavily involved in the red zone. He led the Ravens in red zone carries with 32 red zone carries, 37 red zone touches, which was good for 13th in the NFL, despite ranking poorly in just about every single rushing 
category statistic efficiency wise you could possibly do so they use him so heavily in 2017 right despite knowing how bad he was so that tells me that it's like a coaching thing right and it's not like they changed coaches not like anything changed in the dynamic so what would prevent them from doing so again in 2018 you know what i'm saying like as much as everyone lo absolutely loves alex collins from a talent perspective and what they should be using him for I'm just not sure the coaching staff is going to do the right thing here. And then alongside Suck is Kenneth Dixon, of course, right? He's, he's also like an enigma. No one knows what the fuck is going on with Kenneth Dixon. See, I'm, I'm, old, I'm old enough to remember when Kenneth Dixon was a thing coming out of college. Very hyped up. He, he was a fourth round pick, so he wasn't like a highly, highly touted prospect. But people were very high on Kenneth Dixon because he came out of college with a three down skill set. With Dixon, it's like... How do I explain this with the Ravens? It's like one of those, your ex-girlfriends who like, you still like, but you keep blaming shit on, on, on timing or jobs or work or suspensions or injuries or some shit. You keep blaming other things and you say, oh no, well this time it's gonna work. This time it's gonna work because things are different. That's how the Ravens are with Kenneth Dixon. So many things have gone wrong since they drafted him, but they keep him around. Fourth round pick in 2016, so the same same draft that Alex Collins came in the league, he, he got picked a round earlier. He has a plethora of red flags. First of all, he missed the first four games of his rookie year with a torn MCL, which he did in the summer leading up to his rookie season. The following summer in 2017, people pegged him for a breakout again. He landed on the IR with a torn meniscus. Men meniscus. He missed his entire sophomore year. On top of that, he was hit with a six-game suspension for PED use. That shit didn't make sense. I don't understand that. Like, basically, he, he was already missing the entire year. And then on top of that, the NFL was like, you know what? We're going to give you a six-game suspension while you're sitting out for the entire year hurt. It's one of those things like when someone, like, kills someone and they go to court and they give them, like, 13 life sentences. Like, all right, bitch. I, like, I'm a fucking human being. I get one life. Like, why are you giving me 13 life sentences? I don't understand that shit either. But it's kind of what happened with Kenneth Dixon. Fourth round picks usually don't have this kind of leash. Fourth round picks don't have room for injuries, suspensions. Um, non-performances, you know what I mean? So there's something here to be said with the fact that the Ravens have kept him around for this long, and it's very, very, very high probability this is going to be his last shot. If he doesn't perform how they originally envisioned him performing, right, in 2016, then this will be his last year with Baltimore. That being said, he is still on the roster, so... I don't think he has a a role like permanently there for him. I don't I think he's going to have to work very hard in order to see more than like a 25% snap share in the backfield, but then again, that's still taking away snaps from Alex Collins. What scares me the absolute most in this entire situation is the fact that we have not heard a commitment from the Ravens coaching staff about Collins being the guy. Not even like a little press conference, not even like a yup, we think Collins has earned the right to be our starter. None of that. Harbaugh, their coach, is it just hasn't committed to him. It doesn't make sense to me, man. I don't know. The Alex Collins must have fucked Jim's wife or something like that because he just won't let him be the guy despite how good he was last year. And it's not like I'm not someone who reads so into coach speak. I don't really care much about that stuff. But you hear these other running backs, like for instance, when we talk about Jay Jai, you hear their running backs coach, like Deuce Staley, come out and say, like, yeah, he's our guy. We, he's going to be featured this year and things like that. You need to hear that just to know that they have the confidence and at least he's going to get a longer leash and at least he's going to get the opening touches, right? So even if it is a hot hand approach, at least he has the chance initially to be the hot hand. They're not saying anything about riding Alex Collins, which scares me a little bit. Not even a little bit, it scares me a lot. So, I mean, <clears throat> that being said, I do think Collins is going to be the starter here. Um, I do think he should get the majority of carries and I'm not as worried about his passing down work as, as most people probably are. Because once Collins started getting going, like I said, like from week eight on, he was averaging 19.2 touches per game. You know what I'm saying? So he was heavily, heavily involved. Over the last seven weeks of the season, Collins had three games, three separate games in which he saw six or more targets. That's really heavily utilized. So for them to for them to target him six or more times, like one game, okay, a fluke. Two game, like, okay, maybe we have some. But three games in which he saw six or more targets tell you that they're comfortable with him in a pass-catching role. And Buck Allen, when you look at his numbers in that span, right, when Collins took over from week eight onwards over the, over the remainder of the season, Allen caught more than a single pass. So he caught one pass or more in just two of those nine remaining games. So he was way less utilized in the passing game once Collins started taking over that backfield. And again, what I do like about the situation is that the line should be a lot better. 
Um, they ranked seventh in the NFL in rush attempts, so clearly they do want to run the ball. They're probably going to try to mask Joe Flacco a little bit. If Lamar Jackson comes in, I'm this. I'm not going to debate this right now, but if Lamar Jackson comes in to play the quarterback position, I think that's even more of an upgrade for Alex Collins because we know historically when we look back at a lot of different situations, running backs who play with a, <clears throat> a mobile quarterback, one who rushes and, and commands a linebacker to kind of spy on him, it opens up. It's almost like the running back is playing against 10 defenders rather than 11. That's going to be an upgrade as well for all the for the, the entire backfield in Baltimore. So that's another thing I look at as an upgrade. The line's going to be good. If Lamar Jackson does come in, which I think will happen at some point this year, that's going to be good for Alex Collins. Um, I mean, overall to the normal person, this should be a no-brainer, but that's not the case, right? Collins should be featured, but I think we're going to end up ultimately seeing a kind of like a semi-split between these three running backs, which is kind of scaring me away from Collins a little bit at his current price. So it, it, it's definitely a camp battle to monitor throughout the offseason, right? If we're hearing a lot of reports about how Kenneth Dixon looks incredible and explosive and they're using him in a pass catching role or something like that, then I'd be a little nervous because if someone else takes away the pass catching role, then you're looking at Collins, who's like a 20, between the 20 banger. Buck Allen was used pretty heavily on the goal line as well last year. Like I said, Collins only had three goal line rushes and, and Buck Allen had 37 red zone touches. So uh, it's a messy situation for considering what you want or what should happen is not always you can't always be so optimistic and say this is best case scenario this is what I want to happen this is what should happen it doesn't always work out that way so definitely buyer beware on Alex Collins a little bit because of the backfield split so we move on to my man Jay Ajayi out in Philadelphia 49th overall pick running back 23 at the fundamental basis of this argument in my opinion I think you're pretty much arguing Alex Collins' ceiling versus Jay Ajayi's floor. I think Collins has more of a chance to be the three-down workhorse in Baltimore than I think Jay Ajayi has to be the three-down workhorse in Philadelphia. Because I, I don't really see that happening. However, like I said, Jay Ajayi's floor, in my opinion right now, is very safe. And that could provide tons of value at pick 49, right? That's In a 10-team league, that's the end of the fifth round or the beginning of the fifth round in a 12-team league. So we look back at last year, right? Ajayi was traded midway through the season from Miami to Philly um, after the Dolphins 0 and 0 to 40, smashing from the Ravens uh, in week eight on Thursday Night Football. This is the second year in a row now in 2018 that fantasy owners are kind of in a predicament on what to do with Jay Ajayi in their drafts. Right, they're left in kind of a weird spot on um, on how they see him playing out. Last year, he was very highly touted. Right, he was probably going within the top 12 picks in almost all fantasy drafts. Um, following that 2016 campaign where he rushed for 200 yards multiple times. So obviously, people that invested that early um, early second round or even late first round pick in Jay Ajayi were majorly disappointed because. Him and Miami just did not work out. They wanted him to be the featured back. They had multiple games where they gave him 20 plus carries, but that offense was just awful, right? He didn't get, he didn't see um, any goal line work. He didn't score a rushing touchdown in Miami. Things did not break right for Ajayi. Um, so he ended up finishing the year with two total touchdowns on 233 touches. I didn't look at the numbers, but I can imagine that he that was the lowest scoring rate among any running backs. So on, on two. 132 touches. He scored two touchdowns, which is a 0.8% touchdown rate. Things are awful in Miami. When you take a look at these splits, we're talking about JJ in Miami versus in Philly. The numbers jump out at you. What you see first is that the volume plummeted, but the efficiency skyrocketed. He went from nearly 22 touches a game in Miami down to 11 and a half in Philadelphia. His yards per carry, however, went from sub 3.4 to over 5.8 when he moved up the East Coast, people. 5.8 is ridiculously high. It is a very, 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 very small sample size. So again, buyer beware, which also was shot up by a few big runs, especially in the, his first game with Philadelphia. So when you're only getting 60 or 70 carries on a sample size, one run can absolutely skyrocket your yards per carry. Still, nonetheless, it was very noticeable difference. Um, the volume obviously came from, uh, the dip in volume, I should say, in Philadelphia came from the fact that he was stuck in a committee, right? Where he was the guy in Miami. He ended up stuck in a committee with LeGarrette Blunt and Corey Clement in Philadelphia. Blunt is now gone. He's in Detroit, um, but Corey Clement remains, as does Darren Sproles. They re-signed him to a one-year deal. 
coming down, uh, coming back from a pretty serious injury. Um, so we'll have to see what happens with Darren Sproles. But down the stretch, Ajayi was getting more and more involved as the guy in the backfield, right? Averaging almost 16 touches a game over their last six games, including the playoff. Now, I found something, I found a kind of a crazy stat last year in regards to Ajayi. Just like I did with Devonta Freeman when I when I told you guys to comment down below how many how many rushing touchdowns had Devonta Freeman had in his 50 career games as a starter, and you guys were commenting, guessing below. Comment down below, you'll you'll be entered in one extra uh, chance into the, my Pro Football Focus Edge Package giveaway. If you don't know, I'm giving away one year subscription to one of you guys, one of my subscribers. I'm buying it for you for the 2018 season. All you got to do is one, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram. These will all be linked right here, my handles. Go leave me a rating and review on the podcast, which is just BDGE Fantasy Football. It'll be linked down below. Hopefully, you'll leave me a good one. I guess I didn't really specify, but I would appreciate a five-star rating and maybe maybe a nice little review about saying how what a good guy I am and how my room is really nice and it's always clean and I even make my bed for the videos now. If you comment down below, you'll have an extra entrance into the raffle of whoever wins this. So how many goal line carries did JHI have in the entire season last year? I'll give you guys a few moments to go down below and hit the thumbs up button while you're down there as well, please, on your way down there. That'd be trill. I'd really like you for that. I would appreciate it. Um, okay, so hopefully you commented by now. The answer is that JJ had exactly zero goal line carries in 2017. Zero, despite having 208 total carries. The running backs that he played with last year, the combination of them, Clement had four, LeGarrette Blunt had 10, Kenyon Drake ended up with four. Although Ajayi did not score a lot, he only had two touchdowns, he was given zero opportunity on the goal line. So I don't think you could really fault him in that sense. Now, the goal line role in Philly, historically, when you look back, not even historically, I just mean over the last few years, which is basically the situation that Jai is going to find himself in, the goal line role in Philly is super, 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 super valuable. As we saw, Blunt finished with 10 goal line carries, which was the ninth most in the NFL last year. The year prior to that, when they had Ryan Matthews as their guy, not even their guy, he saw a small snap share, but he was still heavily utilized on the goal line. He had 16 goal line carries the year before, which would have finished, like I think, third in the NFL last year. Over the last three seasons, Eagles running backs combined have averaged 18 goal line carries a year. There's a ton of fantasy scoring to be had here for Philly running backs. Uh, the, the problem kind of comes to um, to Ajayi because Corey Clement is a bigger back as well. He's like 220 pounds, and we started seeing him get some goal line work um, last year too. So it, it's kind of hard to see where um, – it's kind of hard to tell who exactly is going to get the goal line work. That being, that being said, even if they split it, right, 18 goal line carries on the year. Let's say uh, Ajayi gets 10, Clement gets 8, right? 10 – is literally a 10, is 10 more than Ajayi got last year. He had zero goal line carries last year. So that is a huge upgrade regardless. So this Philly goal line role is very, um, it's very valuable because his offense is obviously very good. They're going to score a lot. The defense is good. It's going to set them up in very good position. So um, don't, don't, don't overlook that part of the game. Uh, it's great offense, like I said, with a great offensive line. Uh, well, in theory, actually. It was interesting because I was looking at their offensive line. Now, PFF graded them out as the number one overall line following the 2017 season, but they did not grade well in the running game. They were 24th in Football Outsiders run blocking and 25th in yards before contact per pro football focus. Um, and that ranks behind lines like Denver, Cincinnati, New York Giants. So it's, in, it's interesting because they're so highly touted and they graded overall well by PFF, but in run blocking, they were not... They, they graded out pretty poorly. And speaking on Pro Football Focus's grading, uh, J.J. actually graded out as the fifth best running back overall for Pro Football Focus last year. As I said, Alex Collins ranked first, Ajayi ranked fifth, and Ajayi's always been super, super high in Pro Football Focus's rankings in terms of like elusive rating and just like overall ranking. So when you look at their grading system, which again, you got to take that with a grain of salt because it's kind of subjective, he ranked very highly. So it, it wasn't like his, his game fell off or anything in that sense. 
end what you're hearing out of Eagles camp, right? The opposite of what you're hearing for Alex Collins out of Baltimore's camp. This is per Deuce Staley. I'm pretty sure that Jay is excited about being able to go out there and dominate and being able to be that guy. Just him being focused, coming in, knowing he's the guy that's going to step up there and just put everything on his back and ride with him. Deuce Staley, the OG running bike. I'm old enough to remember my man's Deuce Staley. He is the Eagles assistant head coach as well as the running backs coach. So when you see a vote of confidence like that, that has to be like, ding. Like, okay, they want to use a guy. He's got a, a long leash. And you saw it down the stretch last year that he was becoming their guy. And when you don't hear that, right, you kind of automatically assume that they're going to utilize all the backs. So this is good to hear from an Ajayi owner. What makes me a little nervous is he's pretty much in a committee as well. I'm nervous that Ajayi is going to, again, be like Collins, an in-between-the-20s in guy that's not utilized on passing downs, and he might get goal line work ultimately taken away from him. I'd argue that, you know, both of the other backs in the committee, Sproles and Clement are much better suited for third downs. Sproles is obviously the pass catcher, but he is 35 coming off a of series, 34, 35, I don't know. I think he's 35, coming off serious injury, so there's a good chance that his explosion is kind of lacking. He's not the same guy he was. Time will tell. Um, Clement, on the other hand, Came out as a rookie, undirected free agent, performed very, very well on third downs last year. We saw him getting way more involved in the passing game. Uh, I believe he caught 10 passes in their three playoff games, including a big four for 100 Super Bowl uh, performance. And he also graded very highly per pro football focus in terms of pass blocking for running backs. So that could be a very big factor for um, for him seeing third down work and eventually eating into some of the carries for Ajayi. So that kind of... Uh, freaks me out a little bit. Clement was 13th among 46 qualified running backs. Um, what else do we got? So Ajayi, yeah, I mean, in terms of the pass catching, it's not like Ajayi is not capable of it, right? In, uh, it, he's never really been used as a pass catcher in the NFL, but uh, he was coming out of school touted as like a very, as a three down back, right? Someone who can is definitely capable of playing all three downs. He caught 50 passes in his final year at Boise State, um, which was third among all running backs in the NC double. A in 2014 when he came out. So again, not saying that he will get these looks, but saying that he's definitely not a zero in the passing game. But this is an offense that's going to be very good again. This is a team that's going to be very good again. Uh, it, it's unlikely that they're going to be playing in catch-up mode a lot. So that's a positive for Ajayi. Um, so they might not use Sproles that much when you look at it from a game stance, like a, um, how well the games are going to be going for them. And I think the last thing I want to talk about is JJ's injury concerns. Everyone is quick to comment about how injury prone he is, about how he's one injury away from this or that and, and the whole knee thing. He came out of college with knee issues and he fell in the draft pretty heavily because of that. And we look at the time he's missed throughout his NFL career. Let me break it down for you because I got it all written down here. Look at his rookie year. He missed the first eight weeks of the season with cracked ribs. That's not a predictive injury. You wouldn't worry. You wouldn't say someone's injury prone in the NFL because they have cracked ribs. That's like another way of saying you're an NFL running back pretty much. So that does not concern me, whatever, in terms of long-term health. 2016, he played in 15 of 16 games. The one game he missed was because he was a healthy scratch in week one. That was when they, <laughs> when they brought in, that was the Arian Foster experiment pretty much. JJ was a healthy scratch, so he missed one game. The next year was, uh, was not injury related. Last year, he played in 14 games, and he ended up getting two bye weeks because of that midseason trade, and he was rested for the last week of the regular season. So again, didn't miss any games injury-wise. As Ajayi gets for being injury-prone or being someone who is likely to get injured, I don't think it's warranted, guys. Apart from his rookie season where he missed time due to his cracked ribs, he's been on the field. People will keep talking about his knee problems and blah, 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 and you guys are all fucking doctors and you see him waddle and shit. Guys, he has never, in his three NFL seasons, never missed a game due to his knee injury. Never. So I think it's time we stop using that as a point against him. I would say like the majority of NFL running backs in a three-year sample have probably missed time due to a knee injury. JJ has not, and that was the main concern. So... As far as I'm concerned, he's on the field. He gets his ass on the field. It's time to take a step back from that narrative. The other thing I want to point out, too, I want to talk about this. Let's speak on this. The whole contract year thing. People love to be like, oh, this guy's in a contract year. He's going to explode. He's going to work so much harder. I don't believe that for a motherfucking second. You're not going to average like 4.8 yards per carry as opposed to 4.1 yards per carry because you're in a contract year. You get on the fucking NFL football field knowing that your life is gonna be taken away from you if you don't perform at your top level. These guys are here to fucking eat you and end your life. Whether you're playing for a contract or not, you come out bringing your best stuff. So I hate the contract year theory. I think that's, a, uh, I hate that people use that as a narrative to 
analyzed player. What I do think is a good thing for Ajayi in terms of this being a contract year is in the sense that if you are worried about his injury concerns, a player is definitely more likely to suit up than not suit up if they're in a contract year. I don't think that they perform like a new player because they're in a contract year. I think that if you're, you know, if you're maybe you're a little bit banged up and normally say you just signed a contract, you might sit out because you don't want any long-term issues. You're probably going to power through it and play through it knowing that you only have 16 games in a given year to prove yourself for that contract. So I think uh, the contract year theory plays well for a guy who might be a little more injury prone. So if you are still worried about that for Ajayi, I think that's kind of a positive. So that's, I don't know, that's my breakdown of Collins versus Ajayi. It didn't really come to a clear conclusion, but when all is said and done, this is this was a very, very, very tough, um, a very tough pick for me. I think I kind of love and hate both backs. I love some parts of what they're doing and I hate some parts of what's going on here. I like both guys as players. I like Collins more as a running back, but I like Ajayi's situation a lot more. And at the end of the day, I think what I said is it comes down to Collins' ceiling of being the three down punishing running back there versus Ajayi's floor of being um, the primary running back in a very, very good offense. Every part of me, this is like a heart versus brain. Every part of me wants to pick Alex Collins here but I just do not trust the Baltimore Ravens coaching staff to do the right thing with Collins. I just don't. I need to hear more. If they come out, you know, if we hear like three reports over the next weeks, months coming that Collins has been a beast and they're going to feed him and they're going to feature him, then sure, my opinion could definitely change on these things. Guys, your, your opinion as a fantasy owner needs to be fluid and you need to be able to move depending on the new news that is presented to you. I just think that coaches, right, are going to do the opposite of what you want them to do for fantasy football. For that reason, I will choose Jay Ajayi over Alex Collins in a fantasy football draft. He's the lead back in an offense that was among the top scoring teams in the NFL. 28.6 points per game behind a very good offensive line. We saw him get much more efficient coming over from Miami to Philly, which is what I think we're going to see more of in 2018. So even if the volume is a little bit lower, the efficiency is going to be much higher. Uh, he's still just 25 years old, guys, so it's not like... I know we've been talking about Jay Jai for like, it feels like years now, but he's still relatively young for a running back. The injury thing, which I feel like I pretty much debunked already, should not be an issue that factors into this. I think any running back is at risk for an injury as well as the Jai himself, but I don't think the knee issues are warranted as a piece of analysis. We look at Carson Wentz as well. He had a monster year last year and I do expect him to be back for week one, but he had a touchdown percentage mark of 7.5% which came up from 2.6% in 2016, which is a major jump. Wentz is very, Wentz is good, but 7.5% in terms of touchdown rate is definitely unrepeatable. Aaron Rodgers has hit that once in his entire career. So I look for the touchdown numbers to swing back in favor of running backs this year in Philadelphia. So I think that just plays more into the hand of Jay Jai as well. So again, I'm looking at the floor of Jay Jai as being someone who gets a, a large number of goal line carries in a very good offense behind a good line and is the main rusher here just versus the risk that you have with Alex Collins. I think his floor could be very low, man. If Kenneth Dixon emerges and starts and gets them into a timeshare, it's going to be bad news for Collins owners. So I, I personally pick a Jai here, but let me know now that the analysis is done, what you guys feel, who you guys would take in a straight up one-on-one -on -one situation. And uh, I'll see y'all tomorrow on Wednesday. I will be back regular schedule with uh, my top three tight end breakouts for 2018. Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you're new and I'll see y'all tomorrow. Oh, caught my draft guide too, baby. Coming out in five, six days.